This is a lecture about parenthetical citations or in-text citations. The most important thing to know about in-text citations is that you have to integrate the quote. You can think of that as a quote sandwich or um, an introduction to the quotation. So when you're integrating a quote, you have to have three components. You have to introduce the quote and uh, provide a little bit of context if necessary. Tell me or tell the reader who wrote it, where it comes from if necessary, uh, a little bit of information about the quote if it's required. Of course, you have to include the quote itself in quotation marks, that's very important. Then you have to include the parenthetical citation, what goes in parentheses, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then most importantly, in terms of the quote sandwich, you have to unpack the quote. You have to analyze the quote. It's not enough to just sprinkle quotes or drop quotes throughout your entire essay. You have to introduce them and you have to analyze them, explain them, add to them, even critique them, and connect them to your overall thesis argument. So that's really important, unpacking and analyzing the quote. When you're introducing the quote, you can use a couple different strategies. You can introduce the quote with what's called a tag. That's something like John Smith writes followed by a comma. So you include the writer's name. Now, if you don't want to include the writer's name, you can include the writer's uh, last name in your parenthetical citation. But if it's the first time you're referencing the writer or the critic or the scholar, it's good to include the first name and the last name when you introduce the quote. You also want to include a signal verb. Now you can say something like writes, but it's best to use a really strong verb that's more specific than just says or writes. You could say something like asserts, claims, undermines, explains, describes, critiques, uh, right? Because just saying writes or says is sort of vague. And then after that, you would include the comma, right? So you would say, John Smith, a critic of X at Yale University, asserts, comma. Then you include the quotation, making sure that you're putting any words that are not your own in quotation marks. And then after that, you include the parenthetical citation. Now, depending upon what source you have, um, something different is gonna go in the parenthetical citation. Much of the time, you're gonna be quoting from a text, a physical book, or something that was once published in a physical book or journal. So typically for print works, in parentheses, you include the author's last name, like Smith, and the page number, like 276. Don't put the word page or P period, just the last name and the number itself. Now, if you already have mentioned the writer's name when you introduce the quote, then you can just put the page number in parentheses. And your period goes outside the parentheses because it's the period of your sentence. Even if what you're quoting ended with a period, like in this example, let's say the sentence ended with a period, you take that off and you include your period at the end of the sentence. So let's look at this example. Michael Crichton argues, comma, quote, you or someone you love may die because of a gene patent that should never have been issued. End quote, parenthetical citation with the page number followed by the period. Now, obviously it's weird for me to say quote and unquote out loud, uh, but you get the idea. So I have the author's name, Michael Crichton. I have a signal verb, argues, followed by a comma, the quotation. Most quotes will begin with a capital letter because it's the beginning of the sentence, followed by the page number in parentheses and the period outside the parentheses. There are a couple exceptions to these rules. If the quote had an exclamation point or a question mark in it after issued, you could put that in, but if it was just a period or if you're cutting off the quote there, the period goes at the end of your sentence after the parenthetical citation. Another way you can introduce a quote if you don't wanna use what's called a tag is to introduce the quotation with an independent clause. An independent clause is just something that could be a complete sentence, right? A complete sentence to introduce the quote. So if you use this strategy, you wanna use a colon. Let's take a look at this example. John Twitchell contends that many academics who portray American consumers as passive and brainwashed fail to acknowledge a fundamental aspect of our nature, colon, Quote, we like having stuff, end quote, uh, page number followed by the period. 
Now notice in this example, the quote is actually really short. Uh, it's a really powerful quote though, right? It's powerful in all its simplicity. We like having stuff uh, that's so simple that it's quite effective. But the lead up to the quote, the sentence that introduces the quote, doesn't just say John Twitchell contends, uh, which technically could be a complete sentence. It has what he is arguing, what he's saying in his essay. So you can um, do a little bit of analysis when you're introducing the quote and explain um, what he's arguing in um, the essay. So if you're introducing the quote with an independent clause, you would use a colon. Please remember that a quote, even if it's a complete sentence, cannot stand alone in your essay. A quote always has to be introduced, quoted, parenthetical citation has to be there, and you have to have analysis. Your quote always has to be introduced. If you don't introduce your quote, that's called a dropped quote, which is not acceptable in academic writing. There are a lot of, frankly, annoying and nitpicky rules when it comes to quoting. I don't expect you to know every single rule. I don't know the minutia of every single rule, but I do expect you to know the basics and I want you to know where to go if you run into um, a weird, a different type of source. Like let's say you um, are citing a YouTube video or let's say you're citing a blog post or an interview, a source that's sort of less conventional. I want you to know where to go to find out exactly how to cite the source. I recommend Owl Purdue, which is a free uh, website that's really respected, uh, that's put out by Purdue University. Or of course, you can use your MLA handbook. Look for the 2016 MLA update. That's the most recent one. Uh, you can also use the MLA handbook online, but I've linked to Owl Purdue. Uh, that's the source that I like to use. Here are the big rules that you should know, though. Use double quotation marks for the entire quote, right? Quote, to use those annoying air quotes, the entire quote goes in double quotation marks. Use single quotation marks when you have a quote inside of another quote. Now, this might happen if you're quoting from a short story or a novel where you're quoting the story, but you're also quoting what a character said in the story. Maybe you're writing about The Handmaid's Tale, so you're quoting Margaret Atwood, but you're also quoting what a character Offred said, so you have to use double quotes for the entire quote, but single quotes and you have a character speaking. If you're citing poetry, you include the line number in parentheses as opposed to the page number. That makes sense because most poems, unless they're epic poems, are short. So it makes more sense to cite the line number like line five or line seven or line 14 than the page number. If you wanna take words out of your quote, first off, you wanna be really careful about that. Why are you taking words out? Are you really taking words out to get straight to the point? Or are you manipulating the quote in some way, right? That would be unethical if you're a journalist, if you're a writer, that would be unethical to be manipulating the quote uh, to mislead people. So make sure if you're taking something out of the quote, it's really just to get straight to the point and you're not taking out anything that changes the meaning of the quote. If you do have to take out words, you have to signal that to the reader, right? Otherwise, if you take out words, but you don't give the reader some sort of message that says that you've taken out words, uh, the person who said the quote or wrote the quote might get upset with you and probably would have a good reason to be upset with you. So you have to include dot, dot, dot if you've taken something out of your quote. Obviously, ellipses here, that means something different than if you're texting someone and you see that they're texting you back and you get the dot, dot, dot because they're still writing. Sometimes you have to add words to your quote. So let's say your quote has a pronoun in it, like he or she, and the reader of your essay wouldn't understand who the he or the she is referring to. You might have to add a word, right? If the quote says he, you might have to say Joseph or whatever it is uh, so that the reader would understand what you're talking about. Or if there's a pronoun like it, the reader of your essay might think, well, what is it referring to? So if you need to add words, uh, use brackets. Use brackets sparingly. Uh, if you can, um, alter or change your sentence or quote something a little bit shorter or pick a different quote if you find yourself having to use tons of brackets. There's kind of an ugly and messy punctuation mark, so you want to use them sparingly. Do not quote more than four lines at a time. Now, that's actually a rule that's specific to my class. Technically, you can quote more than four lines at a time in a longer essay. You use something called block format, but for this class, we're never gonna be using block format, so don't even worry about it. Don't quote more than four lines of text at a time. 
Now, the reason for that is that if you quote more than four lines of text at one time, you're probably going to have just a big chunk of quotation without a whole lot of analysis. I don't want to see that you can just make a collage of quotes from other people. I want to see that you take a few well-selected quotes and really unpack them and connect them to your argument. You're not just dropping quotes throughout your essay. You're using really timely, perfect, precise quotes. Then you're doing the hard work of explaining the quote adding examples and connecting back to your thesis statement. Pick a compelling quote and a relevant quote. So I, I would think that this would be sort of obvious, but sometimes a student will say something like, okay, I've chosen a quote, but I have nothing to say about it. It speaks for itself. It's so obvious. It's not interesting. And that may be true, but that's probably a sign that you should pick a more interesting or controversial or problematic or beautiful uh, quote. Pick a quote that has stuff that you can unpack. If there's nothing to say about the quote, then you're probably not using that quote really effectively. You wanna look for rich language, figurative language, look for metaphors or similes that you can unpack. You wanna look for holes in arguments or logical fallacies that you can unpack. You wanna look for a quote that gets to the main idea of the text and you can explain that main idea. Quotes that are complex, uh, pick interesting quotes, don't just pick the first quote that you see. Also, of course, make sure that your quote is relevant and fits within your body paragraph and fits within your overall argument. A couple of points about parenthetical citations. Again, depending on the source that you're using, whether it's an electronic source or a print source, what goes in parentheses is gonna be a little bit different. So I recommend going to the MLA Citation Guide for Owl Purdue or the MLA Handbook. But for print sources, which are really common in this class, you're gonna use the author's last name, the page number, and again, put your period on the outside of the parentheses. If there is no known author, first off, if you cannot find an author, that doesn't necessarily mean that the source is not credible, but it might be a red flag. So think about why it is that you don't see an author. Was it written by a group of people, right? Maybe it was written by a group of doctors in the American Academy of Pediatrics, right? That's gonna be legitimate, but something else that's um, online that has no author might or might not be legitimate. But if it doesn't have an author, but you still wanna use the source, use the shorthand title. So the impact of global warming, maybe the actual title was something longer, maybe there was a colon in there, but for your parenthetical citation, you can use the shorthand followed by the page number. If there is no page number, don't use the page number. Don't include a paragraph, um, just use the author's last name, the name of a shorthand version of the article. And if there is no last name, just use a shorthand version of the article. If there is no page number, don't use the page number. Um, for a website, include the author if there is one and the name of the article. And then most importantly, whatever information that you have in your in-text citation and your parenthetical citation after the quote, that has to correspond to the first thing that I see in that entry on your works cited page. Because the whole point of parenthetical citations so that your reader can say, oh, okay, if I wanna find more about this, I can go to the works cited page and I can read that article for myself by finding that source through my library databases or by checking out a book in the library. So it's really important that whatever goes in parentheses, that's the first thing you see in your entry on your works cited page. And we'll talk about works cited pages in another video. If you're not sure how to cite a source, there's all sorts of sources that we didn't used to have to worry about, right? Like Twitter or social media, things like that. If you're not sure how to cite it, go to the MLA handbook. There's probably an answer. Uh, if there is no answer, remember that the most recent MLA update says that you're trying to use common sense and you're trying to be consistent. They also recommend that you use this idea of containers. So start with the smallest container, the text itself, then the journal it was published in, right? And then move outward and do try to be consistent. Most of the time though, even for really strange sources, um, you can find a, a guide for how to cite that source. You might be wondering how you can analyze your quote. So when I say unpack the quote or analyze your quote, including that last component of the quote sandwich, 
What can you do? Um, how can you analyze that quote? Well, you can explain some terminology or jargon. If you are quoting from a scholarly academic article, chances are there's some terminology that needs to be explained because the average reader might not understand it. You don't need to just define any vocabulary word that seems challenging. Most readers have access to a dictionary, but if it's jargon specific to a particular field, you might wanna spend some time defining it and explaining how it's used in that particular essay. Provide some context. So if the quote isn't gonna make much sense to the average reader out of context, explain what the writer is talking about or what the writer is responding to in this particular part of the text or the story or the academic article. Analyze the quote and connect it to your topic sentence. So you could go back to my lecture about how to annotate text, what kind of figurative language to look for, how to look for golden lines, things like that. So if you're stumped, if you have a quote and you're thinking, oh, this is an interesting quote, but I don't really know what to say about it, go back to that annotation lecture and you can get lots of good tips on what to pull out, what to unpack in your analysis. Usually your analysis is gonna be longer than the quote itself. Your quotation should never be longer than your analysis. Uh, I would actually say when in doubt, pick a dense but really rich quote, even if it's very short, and then provide lots of analysis. Most of the time you need more analysis than quotation.